All right, in the last uh, Instagram post that I made, uh, we took a quick look at this this model that I built of Larkin Street substation expansion by TEF Design. And, uh, and in this video, we're gonna go a little bit more, we're gonna take a, a little bit more time to look at the script. I'm not gonna go super in depth, but I'm gonna kind of break down sort of how uh, how I went about building it, what was like the philosophy behind some of the decisions that I made, um, especially in terms of the sequencing of the design process or the, the modeling process. And so, but first let's take a look at the project. I think it's a, it's a really interesting facade design. As I said in the last post, um, I, I like the nighttime effect, uh, especially I like how these lights are kind of revealed on the open side of the panel. So the panel is kind of lifted from the wall at one edge and then the light is revealed it's almost like the light is revealed from behind that opening and in the daytime is also really interesting because of how these panels throw the light a little bit there's a bit of shadow play and so when we're making our rendering um, this is my comparison rendering we have to make sure that we're orienting the sun in the proper direction and uh, and it's in the proper location to be able to you know make sure we can test that effect properly and this is our nighttime rendering. And all these renderings are straight out of Grasshopper, um, which makes this really uh, practical because I don't have to relocate all these lights. These lights are automatically generated with the script. So when I make a new iteration, uh, this is all taken care of. And so let's take a look uh, with this parametric definition um, what are some iterations that we have available to us? So this is a few iterations that I produced and I was just kind of playing around with different, um, changing the seed values of some of my random parameters to just get different random iterations and also experimenting with, you know, increasing the density of the panels. Ultimately, I think it looks better with the lower density like the original design but there is a interesting effect when you start increasing the density and so we can look at the same night renderings of those iterations i think the night renderings kind of look better uh, or, or at least in terms of these higher density iterations the night renderings kind of um are more interesting with like all these lights so with that let's take a look at the grasshopper script and start to break down how this is working. So we're starting off with these two wall set, or we're ending off with these, with this 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 model. And obviously, we have these panels on two different planes, two different walls. But I but I modeled it on one wall because it's going to be it would be really kind of difficult to model this on two different planes because there is an amount of continuity between this entire length of, of wall so if we took out this split line where the walls are split up uh, it would be perfectly continuous and I think that was how it was designed in the in the original design it was supposed to look continuous between these wall sections uh, I could be wrong but that's that was my interpretation of it so I needed to model it all in one piece in, as if it's one wall and then split it up at the end. So first of all, the only thing that we modeled in Rhino to do this was this line that kind of defines the overall dimensions of the wall. And then everything else was done in Grasshopper. So we threw in, we used the geo pipeline to import that, that curve. And then everything else is built off of that. So I built a, I built a, a curve that's the overall length of the wall. And then I raised it and I used the extend extend curve component so that my pattern is longer than the wall because you can see it kind of, it keeps going like the edges are not defined or anything. So because of these lines going, continuing off, off the wall, right? Like these, like these tiles are only partial tiles that, that, tells me that the best way to do this is just to make more of these panels and then split it up later and trim it later. So so ultimately the full design is a little bit bigger and then it's, and then it's cut up. 
Okay. And, and so basically, you know, the, the fundamentals of, of this is we have, uh, some bands that represent the different, uh, the, the layers of our panel. So that's kind of like the X direction in our grid. And then we also have some polylines that define sort of the, the Y direction of our grid. And these ones are not straight. These are all kind of skewed. And the way that we're doing that is we have two separate, um, random number generators and each one, uh, one of them has a larger domain range or sorry, not a larger range, but larger domain, a range with larger domain values. And one of them has a, a range with smaller domain values. And that's how we're getting the kind of like small, large, small, large, small, large, but it's not totally consistent. Um, that's sort of how we get the kind of like, um, well, that's how we get that kind of triangle looking. You can see that in that the zigzag, it's kind of like a zigzag design, right? And so we take basically with the merge component graph with the inputs grafted, what that means is we're taking, uh, an item from each list, um, and putting it into a branch and then flattening it. So we're getting one item from here, one, one item from here, one from here, 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 alternating, right? So we have these alternating values from these random lists. Okay. And then we're doing some funky stuff that I'm not going to get into again. It's a big script, so I don't want to, uh, go into all this stuff. Um, okay. And then we're using mass addition and we're using our partial results, which I talked about, I think in the last post, we talked about our partial, not the last post, but the last case study, uh, the pharma office with our partial results, we're doing a kind of similar thing. We're just kind of, we're getting the summation of each random number and getting those steps and that, but that's how we're laying it out onto our, onto our curve like this, right? So these are our building curves and then we're using evaluate curve. We're putting in using our partial results to dictate uh, some length points along that curve. And it's giving us an error because some of the points are off off of the curve, but I don't care about that. It doesn't really matter. Okay. And, and then ultimately that's how we're building our polyline with these, with these points. We're joining our polyline with these points. And I'm using a data dam here because when I, cause the rest of this script is a little bit computer intensive. It takes a few seconds to it takes about seven or eight seconds to compute. And so when I want to try making a new iteration, I don't want it to compute every time I make one little change before this, like when I'm changing d the domain or the seed value. So I'll put the data dam in here so that it will stop that data from going through temporarily. When I make my changes, I look at the polylines and I estimate that it probably will work. And then I open up the data dam and let the rest of the calculation take place. So that's why I have that there. Okay, what else is going on here? Um, we're splitting up the... Uh, so we're going to start splitting up these polylines into smaller sections because I'm trying to define the inner region of each panel so that I can cut out these uh, these like fins that are creating our shadow play. So I need to... So I need like an offset portion of each panel. So that's why we're, we're starting to offset um, uh, the overall shape, the overall bands or the overall panel grid. And what that looks like in the end, not in the end, but it's at some point we're using an extrusion and these are separate. Uh, you can't really see the joints, but these are separate panels. And at the same time, we're creating some, um, We're creating some curves like this and these curves, uh, obviously, because if you look at the, the project, these curves are going all the way down. So it's like, I'm dividing each section into like a full section like this, and I'm creating those curves going, uh, kind of splaying between this line and this line. And then I'm going to break it up with these, with these extrusions, right? So I'm using trim with B rep to do that. 
And what we would get is something like this. So now it looks like this. I use tr trim B rep to trim basically wherever these extrusions uh, intersect with these curves we get our trimmed regions and so that's how I'm getting the base curves for those for those uh, for that texture and meanwhile uh, in parallel to that we're also creating our panels so the, the texture is kind of created separately from the actual panels themselves so I have a script here where I'm taking uh, these surfaces uh, I've taken this I've taken the the main surfaces like this this surface these surfaces and I've split it up I've split this with our original polylines and so we're getting uh, some we're getting pretty close to what our panels look like at that point okay but we still have a lot of work to do because we need to make them three dimensional. We have to uh, we have to create like an, a script. We have to create an alternating pattern. So we're going we're alternating by, between flat and sheared, flat sheared, flat sheared. So in an alternating like a checker pattern, one of them is sheared. But if you look closely, um, they're not all. There's no pattern that's dictating how the shearing. Uh, transformation is working necessarily except that it's 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 on it's not always in one direction but it is always in one or the other direction so it's either it's either fixed on this edge on the top edge or it's fixed on the left edge you will see that none of them are fixed on the right edge or the bottom edge um, obviously it could be a problem if they were fixed on the bottom edge because you'd have you know you'd have a potential for uh, build up of water or a water opening and i guess they were fixed probably on the left side to keep the shadow play looking consistent so now we always have a drop shadow on one side of the uh, of these objects okay so we have to select an alternating with an alternating culling pattern or our dispatch pattern we have to take alternating objects and then shear them off the wall on a random edge so that's what I'm doing here. Um, first, I'm identifying which panels are intersecting with this with this curve, which tells us where our wall is going to split. Because it, you'll notice that none of the panels that are touching that are uh, at these at this wall split are being sheared. So I'm using that to cull those or, or dispatch them into uh, into the list that doesn't get sheared. So I basically I'm splitting up our panels. I'm splitting up this list into which panels are going to be sheared off the wall and which panels are going to be left flat. So I have to do a few a few tests um, to create some true or some boolean values to determine what that list looks like. So I'm using some alternating uh, uh, boolean values and I'm using some tests to figure out which panels are intersecting with that curve because I again I want to automate everything, right? And so we're using dispatch to split our list into the ones that are being sheared and the ones that are not going to be sheared. Okay. And so right here, we've got our checkerboard. Uh, these are the ones that have been designated to get split. And at this point, I have to identify uh, within this list, I have to identify the edges that are the top edges and the left edges so i've identified that of this of this list of this list i have to identify which ones are the top edges which ones are the left edges and then i'm going to choose and i'm creating the i'm creating a part of the algorithm that randomly selects one or the other so it's going to select the top edge or the left edge um, uh, randomly on a case-by-case -case basis so that's what this looks like. So now we have some random edges selected. And then we select, uh, and then we also select the opposite edge and create a loft between them. Because I was the, uh, well, I move one of them. So I, I select the right or the bottom edge. I move it off the wall. 
So a pretty simple operation. Move it off the wall, okay? And then I just loft between this one and this one. And now we have our sheared object. And we could use the shear component to do this, but I thought, I think this is simpler. I think this is a, a more simple way to do it in this case. Okay. So that's the, that's the, that's the kind of the foundation of our sheared panel. And then we just, we have to do a whole bunch of more work where we're, we have to turn it into a solid because I want to be able to fill it, this object. So I'm lofting between a flat panel and the sheared panel. And then I'm going to use the, I'm going to, well, I've created a solid because I, I lofted it. Uh, I capped, I capped it. So now we have solids. And now I can uh, fill it the edges. So I've selected all the convex edges. So I've done convex edges as a list that gives the, that provides the indices of the, of these edges with a, with a fillet distance of 20 millimeters. And now we have some nice filleted edges. And um, this is really important guys to know. Sometimes you really have to put a fillet on your edges to make your rendering look, you know, like just acceptable. This is not, this is not, a, this is not an amazing rendering um, by any standard, but I, I, I have a benchmark that I have to reach when I do like very simple renderings and and in a case like this absolutely has to have a fillet. This would look awful if it didn't have fillet. You would you wouldn't have any defined edges between the panels. And just the way that it would catch light would just look wrong. So a simple thing like putting a fillet on your edges makes makes your renderings look ten times better, even when it's a very simple rendering like this. Okay. And so while that's happening, we created our fillet filleted panels if we go back to our patterning um, we had the that patterning that texture and what we did is we took our lofted panels our original 2d uh, surfaces and we just projected it we had to do some weird data management to kind of re-sort the sequence of the list and if I were doing this if this is a real project I would definitely just start over, start this whole thing over. This, like I always, whenever it's a real project, I do the whole thing and then I start over from scratch and do it again because I'm always going to be able to manage the data better the second time. So at this point in the script, I'm kind of struggling to uh, keep everything working properly. But but again, I don't put much time into these case studies. Um, I just sort of do it as a proof of concept. So anyways, uh, we're doing some data management here so that our sequence works properly and then we can do our projection so that's where we're projecting all of our curves all of our flat uh, curves that are, that are planar onto these lofted sheared surfaces okay and the simplest way to make them 3d is just to do a pipe so that's pretty straightforward just pipe those curves and then we just put them all into uh, into one BREP component and we can throw that into our, oh, right, we moved it. That's what we did. We split the list. We split our list into any of the objects that are in this wall section. And then we, we moved that out to the front and then recombined our list into this final, final group of geometry. And then we can throw that into, into V-Ray and do our rendering. So that's the basics of how this script is working. Just the, a rough outline of, of how I built this. Um, let me know if you have any specific questions. I'm happy to answer them. And like I said, I'll probably be making some videos talking about some, some little specific uh, aspects of the script or certain, uh, you know, lessons learned about certain components or uh, some tips about how to use certain components. So stay tuned if that's something that's interesting to you. I uh, hope you learned something from this video and uh, I'll see you later.